I'm Carla Eller, the curator of the photography collection here, and we're um, thrilled to see all of you here at our first event of the semester and of uh, 2015. Um, we're honored to present the photography of Michael O'Brien. In the Face of Texas exhibition, his um, compelling portraits of Texans are paired with um, stories by Elizabeth O'Brien. And um, um, let's see. Our program will begin with a presentation by Michael and follow with a uh, conversation between Michael and David Coleman, our director of the Whitliffe Collections. Um, and then we should have time for questions at the end. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to recognize um, our founding donors who are with us, Bill and Sally Whitliffe. And from the library, our Associate Vice President and University Librarian, Joan Heath. And I'd also like to recognize and thank Elizabeth O'Brien, who, for the exhibition, um, condensed and edited her own stories for our exhibition labels. So thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> A two-time recipient of the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award for Outstanding Coverage of the Disadvantaged, Michael O'Brien has photographed subjects ranging from small-town heroes to rock stars to presidents. He has worked as a freelance photographer for over 30 years for national publications including Life, National Geographic, and Texas Monthly. In 2011, his book of portraits of the homeless were published in Hard Ground. And um, we're celebrating The Face of Texas, which was published by University of Texas Press um, late last year. And it's for sale today. Um, and the original edition uh, was published in 2003 by uh, Bright Sky Press. So, um, but I also want to mention that uh, 18 of Michael's portraits have been selected for inclusion in the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. And <laughs> And the Whitliffe is honored to have five of them on exhibit uh, in the Face of Texas exhibition. Please join me in welcoming uh, Michael O'Brien. Thank you, Carla. All mine. Well, I, I appreciate you all coming. And uh, as I look over the audience, I, I have one thought comes to mind. Wow, Elizabeth has a lot of friends. <laughs> My two, I had two coming and one uh, couldn't make it. <laughs> but, uh, but, but thank you all very much. And um, what I want to do now is just, it really just tell you stories about the books and show you about 25 pictures. And, uh, but, but as I start, I just gotta, I gotta say thank you to a few people and I'm a little bit nervous I, I'm going to leave somebody out, so if I do, I, I, please forgive me. But first I want to th start, you know, thank the staff at the Whitliffe, um, David Coleman, director, Carla Ellert was a curator for the exhibit, um, Linda Guz was the events coordinator, and Michelle Miller for the graphics. And um, I want to thank Bill and Sally Whitliffe, who had the vision to create and make this rich collection a reality. And it, it, it enriches all of our lives to have this here. I um, want to thank Rue Judd, who published the first edition of the book. Um, my friend in arms and uh, DJ Stout, uh, who assigned many of the pictures while he's art director at Texas Monthly. And Julie Savasky, who works with DJ, helped design the first edition of the book. And both are here today, and I'm honored. Um, my thanks to UT Press for, and Dave Hamrick for coming up with the idea of updating it and making the book still live on, and Lindsay Starr for doing the design of that, that edition. Um, boy, a photographer with a lot of heavy equipment uh, wouldn't get very far in Texas unless he had a lot of good people that would help him and get him to where he's going because I'm directionally impaired. And, uh, <laughs> And so I want to thank the assistants to help me. Um, um, Matt Lankus, who's here today, a great photographer himself, David Zickel, Bill Albrecht, Will Phillips, Matt Sturdivant, George Brainerd, 
Robert Von Gardner, and Susie Biddles. John Scott's here, he did the beautiful frames. Um, Jay Scraff, who is a, a wonderful, wonderful artist in his own right that made an elegant special edition of, the new, of this new book that UT Press did, special limited edition, eight copies. Um, and finally, uh, I want to thank my wife, Elizabeth, for writing all the stories that make uh, the, the, the characters come, come to life. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks to our, to our children, Jesse, Owen, and Sam, for their support. Okay. All right. Showtime, showtime. All right, so I'm not a Texan by birth. I was born as a city kid born in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, raised in the city, scared about horses. And I wrote in the beginning of the book that I don't have a cowboy boot, cowboy hat. My boots give me blisters, and I've never shot a gun. I'm nervous around horses and I can't lasso a steer. But I love big clouds, wide spaces, mythic characters, and the Western spirit. I've fallen in love with Texas, and it's my home. So how did I get from Memphis, Tennessee, to Brooklyn, New York, and then finally to Texas? <laughs> I got to say, I love doing this to Bill, but uh, <laughs> so the story begins. This is not in the picture, not in the exhibit. It's one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken in my life. But in 1985, I was living in Brooklyn, New York, and I was um, sent to Texas by Life magazine to photograph the making of the Redheaded Stranger. Bill Whitliff was the director and the screenwriter of the movie. Willie was the star. And this photo was made while they were watching dailies. Now, from the moment in my life that I picked up a camera, it's kind of led me to where I eventually ended up going. Meeting Bill was pivotal in choosing to settle in Texas. Now, 85, we stand here 30 days later, 30 years later, and all the, I'm so happy that all the photographs will have a permanent home in this collection. So, Bill, I'm glad I met you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Isla Johnson was born in 1905, lived in Spur, Texas for almost nine decades. She lived to be 103 years old. Retired school teacher, was 97 when she renewed her Texas driver's license. <laughs> Fortunately, her next door neighbor was a friendly patrolman who vouched for her. <laughs> Isla said, I guess I'm not too slow and I'm not too fast, revealing one of her secrets of her longevity. Unmarried, she taught civics and history at Spur High School for 33 years and, and got her students to try college. Texas Monthly wrote, a small town without a character to is like a water tower without graffiti <laughs> or a buzzardless blue sky. Town characters are the vi video, village idiosyncratics of Texas today. This is Obi Satterwhite, who was the number one sports fan of Luling. He rarely missed a football or baseball game at the high school, and he earned the special status of performing on the field with the cheerleaders. <laughs> He'd run out with the, at the beginning of every day with the, you know, with the cheerleaders to start the game at Luling High School. So appropriately, I photographed Obi in the middle of Main Street dressed in his shark skin suit. <laughs> the pro wrestler Kevin Von Erich in Denton 19-2005. Um, Kevin Von Erich was known as the Barefoot Boy for his trademark of storming into the ring barefoot, eschewing the requisite high top wrestling boots. 
Von Erich is the last surviving son of a wrestling dynasty. His father, Fritz Von Erich, was the notorious longtime wrestling promoter who created the world-class championship wrestling. And Kevin was the inspiration for a toy motel action figure. <laughs> Andy May Hayes was the manager and the dispatcher for a City Taxi in Waxahachie for 24 years. She was here till she couldn't go anymore, said Hayes' boss, Robert Barber. She was one who believed in the soft answer, the quiet spirit, and the silence in the time of an uprising. It always brought forth the right kind of fruit. One of my favorite, favorite pictures when I, I sometimes you can kind of, when you get assignments, you can almost visualize what the picture that you're, that you haven't taken could be. And this, this one I saw of, of Ben Crenshaw. And um, there's a story about Harvey Pinnock and, and Ben Crenshaw. And it was when Ben Crenshaw was just eight years old, he paid a visit to the golf pro Harvey Pinnock at the Austin Country Club. Pinnock cut off a seven iron for him, showed him a good grip, and took him out the course. Looking at the green 75 yards away, Pinnock told young Crenshaw to tee up a ball and hit it onto the green. Crenshaw did just as he was told. Once on the green, Pinnock told him to put it in. Crenshaw turned to him and said, if you wanted it in the hole in the first place, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> this is Harvey Pinnock and, uh, and, and Bud Shrake, and we're honored to have his son Ben Shrake in the audience today. Um, one, again, one of my favorite pictures, I love golf. Um, and Bud Shrake collaborated with his golf pro friend, Harvey Pinnock, on Harvey Pinnock's Little Red Book of Golf, Little Red Book, which became then the best-selling sports book of all time. Shrake transformed Pinnock's five by seven red scribble text notebook, which was a 60-year compilation of golfers, the golfer's considerable wisdom into a blockbuster work of positive psychology, sports psychology. <coughs> Shrake said a fine thing of Pinnock. Harvey came closer than anybody I know to living by the golden rule. At the end of time, I felt, Shrake said I've been, Shrake said, I, at the end of time, Shrake said, I felt like I've been chosen by a divine force to do it. And the book is just a wonderful, wonderful, whether you like golf or not, it's chock full of, of wisdom about life and the world. These are some of the pages from the book, and this is of Lynn Wyatt, the socialite in, in Houston. Um, now, Lynn has a first degree black belt in karate, um, but judging by the dress, she also has a black belt in shopping. <laughs> you know, she, was, she was born in 1935 and became known for lavish parties and fundraisers, fundraisers at the, her Houston mansion. Um, So this was originally made for National Geographic, and, um, and I made it in 19, 1989. That's 26 years ago. But I remember the day like it was yesterday. My assistant, Bill Albrecht, and I were greeted by a lone Secret Service agent at the LBJ Ranch. Ladybird presented us with iced tea and a plate of cheese sticks. <laughs> and then asked me what, she, what I wanted her to wear. And I looked puzzled, and she grabbed me by the hand, and she led me to the closet <laughs> to look at her wardrobe. <laughs> this is the only time I've ever been in a closet with the First Lady. <laughs> Ben
Bishop T.G. Jakes. When T.D. Jakes was a schoolboy, he earned the nickname Bible Boy for toting his Bible to school every day and preaching to an imaginary congregation. Jakes, the son of a janitor, never relinquished his dream. He was called to the ministry at 17 and eventually became a senior pastor of Potter's House, a mega church. His TV ministry is viewed all over the world. He had a lovely quote, which I'd like to read you. He said, I think the first step is to understand that forgiveness does not exonerate the perpetrator. Forgiveness liberates the victim. It's a gift you give yourself. So I made it for Time Magazine, and I met him one hour before I was supposed to take his picture. And this immense, powerful man walks up. And I knew a little bit about him, but he was just so large and formidable. The spark went off in my head, and I thought, a dove, a nice, fragile white dove. And I went over to his assistant, and I said, I have a pretty good idea, but it's a problem with that. I, I, I have the idea, but I don't have the, the dove. <laughs> <laughs> and usually you tell him, that, you know, the assistant said, this isn't going to happen. Forget it. Get out of your head. You take your picture and, and pack your equipment, and you go. And 15 minutes before Jake's came to have his picture made, the assistant walks in with this beautiful white dove. So miracles happen. <laughs> Rosemary Marilla celebrated her wedding in June 1989 at the Flamingo Ballroom in Austin. Since her father had died, she danced with her best friend, with his best friend, Douglas Elizondo. My dad always counted on him, said Rosemary. From the Town Character series, Ran Horn in, in Van Horn, Texas, 1998. Van Horn was known as the Van Gogh of Van Horn. <laughs> right, right. For years, he owned an art gallery in a used bookstore in Van Horn where he sold his own Van Gogh imitations and taught art lessons for $5 a pop. Uh, he was a former Baptist preacher and a prison guard and mail carrier. And uh, uh, this is his dog, Lillian. Um, I'm working with a lot of animals now, dove in last picture and now a dog. This. Emma Field Mallon, uh, 1998, Marfa, Texas. Emma owned and managed the historic Pisano Hotel in Marfa for many years and for a heady six weeks in 1955, the hotel was home to the cast and crew of Giant, starring James Dean, Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson. In later years, Mallon retired and lived a quiet life on a ranch with her friend Margaret. The pair came to town every Thursday morning to have their hair done at uh, Helena's Beauty Shop, where this picture was made. This is Kelly Willis, an Austin singer-songwriter, photographed at Louis Mueller's barbecue out in Taylor, Texas. But I, I can say if you have Louis Mueller's barbecue as a background and you have the beautiful Kelly Willis as your subject, you shouldn't be able to make a bad picture. <laughs> this is Darden Smith, the singer and songwriter from Austin, Texas. Everybody knows Darden, a very good friend. And George Strait uh, at Prasal. Um, in 1991, and I was telling uh, David Coleman and I were talking about this, and I was telling, well, what's it like to photograph George Strait and you know be out there in this ranch at the end of the shoot? Excuse me. And I said, well, you know, we photographed in the summer, and it was like 9:30 at night, and we had finished, and we're. The crew had a stylist and had assistance with the lights and everything. And George said, uh, looked at us and unexpectedly said, would you all like to go out to dinner? And kind of, would we like to go out to dinner with George Strait? Of, co of course we'd like to go. But where are we going to go? This is the middle of nowhere. There's no place to eat. And um, we said, well, George, where were you thinking? Uh, 
And he said, uh, the Cadillac Bar in Laredo, which was about, you know, <laughs> 85, 90 miles away. But, you know, this was the chance to go eat with George Strait, so we're not going to turn it down. And uh, all jumped in our cars, and we, you know, it looked like they're closing the lights, but we were, you know, we knocked on the door, and we had George Strait with this, and they turned everything back on, and we got seated at 1230. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt Thomas Williams, or the Gray Ghost, as fans knew him, was one of the last original Barrel House blues pianist. He spent years performing at clubs along the Texas and Pacific Railroad from Dallas to El Paso, donning overalls over his stage attire, hopping freight trains from gig to gig, and stashing his overalls in the bushes at each depot. I'm just like a ghost, he told his bewildered fans, who never saw him arrive or leave. I come up out of the ground and then I go back in it. So this is uh, Beyonce. She's uh, really before she became Beyonce, I think. Uh, she was part of Destiny's Child when I made this photograph. Anyway, she was just 19 years old, and she came in with the group. And um, I tried to get all of them to put their heads together. I was having trouble and just decided I'd do individual pictures with, of each of the girls, of the four girls in the group. But um, it's looking back, you know, so 13, 14 years in her meteoric rise to fame. Um, it was nice, they, they were just the, the nicest group of girls and so modest. And going through the film again and looking at it, um, there is such a thing as photogenic, and it's Beyonce. There was not one bad picture that I had taken. I don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, what can you say about three ordinary guys getting a haircut in a small town? <laughs> now you can't say much, you know. That's, uh, um, now, everybody knows a lot about ZZ Top, right? I know who they are. So the band was inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2004, but they have another claim to fame. They do. They have offered its ser their services to NASA as the lounge band for the first passenger flight to the moon. <laughs> so if you want to hear them and you don't want to pay for a concert and you want to go to the moon, this is a way to combine <laughs> two things. Uh, George Dawson was a grandson of slaves. He grew up poor on a small farm in Marshall, Texas. He was the oldest of five children. He started working full-time for his father when he was four, hauling water from the well, working in the cotton fields, and feeding the family's chickens. They lived in a three-room three -room cabin with an outhouse and a small barn. School was not an option. So Dawson learned to read and write at age 98 and co-authored a memoir called Life is So Good at 102. He died one year later at 103. This is Bob Holloway, a, a dairy farmer in Decatur. Larry McMurtry, Archer City, 1997. And this was his bookstore um, and this Archer City is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And so when I arrived, uh, this was made for the, the New York Times Sunday Magazine. This Pulitzer Prize famous author was up on a stepladder with a pencil behind his ear, marking each book in price one by one. Yeah, yeah. I, I made him come down from the stepladder <laughs> before I took his picture. So you know, this was made with DJ was with me on, on this one. And uh, um, 
we went down, this is 1993, went down to photograph Kinky on his uh, ranch uh, in Kerrville. Um, now, he went on to great things after I did this picture of him. He, uh, <laughs> when he was running for governor, he came, he got the, this campaign slogan, he ain't kinky, he's my governor. <laughs> and he was interviewed a lot, you know, heavy duty questions like political candidates are. And uh, they asked him how old he was. And he said, I'm 59, but I can read on a 61 year level. <laughs> <laughs> and if those, those of you that know kinky and, and have and photographers who have suffered through photo shoots, uh, this would mean, he, Kinky was explained that Jesus and he were both Jewish, that neither of them had a job, neither of them had a home, they, neither of them married, and they traveled around the countryside irritating people. <laughs> yeah. Mona Green came to town every Saturday to have his hair cut at Tenery's Barbershop in Waxahachie. Um, this is uh, just nothing more than just a simple everyday moment of the dignity and I think the elegance of an everyman. And uh, one, of, one of my favorite pictures, and I'm glad it's uh, up there, part of the exhibit. Rick Linkletter in, in Austin, Texas. Uh, who just made it the amazing movie, Boyhood. Um, and I photographed him and had, um, you know, you have, they don't want to spend the whole day with you, so you have a limited <laughs> amount of time and you're trying to work quickly and trying to keep them engaged. And I'd photographed him in his office and everything and I really had nothing that I was happy with. And as a last ditch effort, I said, could I go up and, and look at your roof? And then this perfect, you know, all the urban movies and gritty movies he had made, we had this scene was up there, and so we set up a light, and he stood in the middle, and we had the, had the photograph. So fortune prevailed. <laughs> Sissy Spacek uh, in her hometown of Quitman, Texas, back in 1990. Judge William Wayne Justice in Tyler, Texas, in 1982. It's the uh, first picture, um, uh, the earliest picture in, in, the, in the, the face of Texas. And Judge William Wayne Justice the son, was the son of an eminent trial lawyer. He had an innate destiny for the high road. In the face of prejudice and good old boy politics, he made a monumental reforms for human rights in Texas. His controversial rulings were instrumental in desegregating schools and reforming the prison system and educating undocumented documented immigrants. And um, Earl Campbell in Blanco, Texas, and again, this was, my partner in crime was, was DJ. And I remember we wanted to make him look epic and heroic, so he searched for a very small town football stadium and found one in Blanco. We got them to turn on the lights and we had the sunset and Earl arrived and got in, you know, got him all dressed up and everything and he's a great, great, great guy. I really, really love Earl Campbell and a humble man, a very, very humble man. And I made the picture and it, um, it ran a full page in Texas Monthly. And I said, man, this is great. I had a good opportunity and made the most of it and hopefully produce something artistic that will live on over the years. And about a year later, and Earl, Earl called up and said, you know, I really like the picture. So another, another accolade. And I said, oh, yeah, well, here's a copy and everything. So my wife, a year later, was in Randall's and she was uh, shopping and she, she had, told me, wait at home, I got something very exciting to tell you. And I go, okay, great, great. And so she comes home, she throws it out on the table, and there on Earl Campbell's pork sausage is my photograph. <laughs> so 
you may get your pictures on museum walls, but you got to remember, you know, you're either going to be at the bottom of the kitty litter or somebody's sausage packaging. <laughs> So I wanted to, we're coming to the end, and, and um, I wanted to end with this picture of, of Willie Nelson, and uh, this is from 1989 in Spicewood. And one of the things, I'm not going to say anything more about Willie, except a wonderful, wonderful person. Nobody better to be on the cover of the book. Um, I love this photograph. This is one that is lucky enough to be in the National Portrait Gallery. But one of the things I, in, in doing this talk today, I found out he's a philosopher. And one of the meaningful things he said that I will share with you is um, the reason divorces are so expensive is because they're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you gotta want to get divorced, you got to pay a lot of money. Now, but he also, if, you know, he's, he, he philosophizes about golf. And since I want to bring it all back to golf again, um, and Willie said, par is whatever I say it is. <laughs> in fact, I've got one hole on my course that's a par 23. <laughs> and yesterday, yesterday, I damn near birdied the sucker. <laughs> So this is my collection. I hope you enjoy the exhibit and, and, and get a chance to take a look at the book. And Elizabeth, thank you for writing the beautiful words and text. And, uh, uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's it. I thank you all very much. <laughs>
I worked for the school newspaper and made four dollars for every picture I got published. So I was getting paid to do something I loved, made a little money, and I've essentially been doing the same thing ever since. And you know, <laughs> God in life, if you if you get paid for doing what you love, how can it get any better, you know? And I got actually hired to be the darkroom boy at the Miami newspaper, and they had seven photographers, one quit, and so I got uh, upsized. <laughs> you know, I got a photo <laughs> car, police radio. You were in. And I thought I was the Ouija of uh, Miami. And I had it crackling on all the time, and whenever there was, you know, what you had to do in covering the town, cover the good, the bad, the cook of the week, and uh, the, 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 the violence, yeah. And, 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 and feature stories. And so I, I, this was actually um, the policeman, Vernon Hetherington, who was featured as the, the, the policeman of the week, which they did a daily, a weekly feature. And while I was photographing from that, an armed robbery was occurring up the street. <laughs> and what was amazing is that he had, he had he almost, he was like he was wired to know something was off and this car was coming around the corner with the fleeing armed robbers, and Hetherington draw, drew his gun and <coughs> shot the passenger and wounded the driver. The car crashed, and he became a national hero. And the weird thing is, I had no recollection of whether I had taken pictures of this or not. <laughs> <laughs> There was a guy, the guy that got robbed was running down the street and he was shooting at the car fleeing and the, and the windows behind us were getting shot out. Um, wow. But I took pictures and, uh, <laughs> and, you know. and... And you sent more that I don't have here today. And when we were working on this program, Michael sent probably about 100 images, I think, of work that you've done that I had never seen, we had, we had never seen, and I, I tell I you, I had an opportunity to your things. <laughs> and it, I wish I had time to show you the hundred images, because they are unbelievable. His, his talent is just amazing. And there is kind of one by one, second by second, of this scene played out, but this is kind of the best opening shot. <laughs> this we actually featured in our, in our newsletter, the Keystone, uh, some time back. This is Nixon resigning. Yeah, uh, so 1974. So it is, it's again back what you do at a newspaper, and and this was the beginning of my career. I just I I I would pinch myself every morning to think that I had this job to get to, to cover the news, and we knew that Nixon was going to resign, and we had six photographers, and we all got sent to a different part of Miami, and this was a, a blue collar bar in Coral Gables, and by this time, the country was just exhausted with Nixon, and. He was up resigning, and they, they're basically gone back to their smoke and their drink. Yeah. That's great. That's so great. And the bar is called Duffy's. And Duffy's it, Bar. Yeah. And uh, I just noticed this sitting here. This is the first time I've seen this. This is a theme that's following you throughout. Yeah. Oh. Is, and you can't see it in the back, but it says Duffy's Invitational Golf Tournament. It's, a, <laughs> it's an award. <laughs> It always, always, ever, always comes back to the, the golf I don't know thing, if you ever played in, in Duffy's Invitational, but No. So talk about Colmer. I have uh, four images here, and I can go through them one by one. Yes. Um, so one of the things I was interested in very early on was the power of the camera to communicate. And, um, um, and since the, the, the paper printed you know, 100,000 copies every weekday, um, and they were always reporting that you always get the statistics about the illiteracy rate, about the poverty rate, uh, about sections of town not being being neglected. And I really ad I admired all the, the the early social documentary photographers. I looked. I loved Eugene Smith, who was a great Life magazine photographer, and the people that used their cameras with purpose. And uh, so the editor and the paper allowed me to go and do a documentary on the Central African American district of, of Miami known as uh, Colmer. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy standing outside of a pool room. Um, I don't know if that's from Colmer. That's from Colmer okay, too, great. yeah. That's a, just a, a family on their porch. And I mean, I said, going back to the Whitliff picture, that the camera, that from the moment I picked up a camera in my life, it sort of guided me. It was like, having a divining rod to get to life. And, and 
that I was, um, I'm humbled that I was allowed to be at these places and be able to take pictures of, the, of these people and get to know them and also to communicate mm -hmm. yeah, photographically. I think of Father. the series you sent, this is my favorite, just portraiture fitting into kind of yeah. the journalism of the day. So talk yeah, so about I, that. Yeah, so I mean, when I look at the, like, um, you would look at the work on the wall, the color pictures, and the celebration of Texas, and I would say that, that those pictures were always in me, and I had that uh, whatever portrait style or ability it was, um, I was doing it early on and trying to develop it at the newspaper. And so this is, I think, very similar of just a simple <coughs> portrait of a father and his daughter, but done very graphically. It's, so. It's terrific. And you won one of your, one of your two. One of the Kennedy. Kennedy Awards, awards for yeah. work on Coleman. Well, the paper, yeah, I, I, yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, I guess I did. The, 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 you I, did. I, without the paper publishing it, I wouldn't have won it, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, without them hiring you, they wouldn't have won it. No. Yeah. <laughs> I got lucky. <laughs> so and this is Sunland Center. Yeah. So Sunland Center was a was a big state center for the retarded, and uh, and again, it was it was uh, how do you how do you report the news and then humanize it? So it's two two retarded girls at the institution, but there was a bond between them, and uh, I was lucky that you know the paper got me in, I was lucky to be able to stay there and photograph it, and got this picture of Brenda and Kim. It's fantastic, so powerful. It, to me, this was one of my favorites of all that you sent, and it, yeah. I, it makes me think of Kudelka, it makes me think of just a, this history of photography. But it's, it's in, are you from Tennessee? I know you're from Tennessee, to, yeah, I'm a Tennessean, yeah. Yeah, yeah both Elizabeth and I are from Memphis, and. This is East Tennessee, and um, when my daughter Owen went off to college, it was the only sort of happy picture I could think to send her off to college and put on her wall. And I, I called it Tennessee Dream or something. And here you go, make good grades and Did it look work? at the picture. <laughs> um, and it was done for it's done for Time Magazine, and I got. Um, um, was when Jimmy Carter was elected back in the 70s and they wanted to, Time wanted to do something of the South and I was an up and coming photographer working in the newspaper and they said, just go to the South and photograph. And so, <laughs> it never ran, uh, but. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, I, I think it's magical, really magical. So you were, you were still working at the Miami News? Yeah, so yeah. In I took the weekend off and did the, did okay. the Time Magazine assignment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So this is a, a pirate I think you have. In yeah, and it, I mean, it, this is an odd story. It, it won't make any sense. Um, I was sent to Belize to do a story on sports fishing for Sports Illustrated. And we were going, the guy that owned the, the sort of, was the guide, was taking the sports fishermen all to these great fishing spots. And we came up to this kind of deserted island and this guy was there scavenging what rolled up on shore. Mm. He didn't live there, he just had a boat. And so I had one little handheld flash and took his picture and, um, you know, I, I got really lucky, I think, on that one. <laughs> well, I think for the good photographers, luck, you know, you make luck happen. You know, you are there, you make it happen, it's there for you. I think this is really powerful. So thanks for turning off the yeah. spotlight. Yeah, well, in, in these it's very, very dark. So um, I'll show these, and then the last one is is Judge Justice that okay. you, you already talked a little bit about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but he was a powerful man, someone who kind of turned against the tide of of popular, I don't know, wish and will, and did a lot of reform with the justice system and the prison system. Right. So then, and this was what, 1982? 1982. Yeah. For life. October 1982. So talk, I don't know, talk about this assignment, and I've got uh, four images to show. Okay. So um, when, I, when I left the newspaper in 79, um, 
all my heroes, we didn't have a photography school at University of Tennessee, so, but they had all of the Life magazines, the weekly Life magazines started publishing in 1935 all the way to 1972. So I knew all the great photographers, Gene Smith, Leonard McComb, Alfred Eisenstadt, and I would go look at their stories of how they were published in life and looked at their craftsmanship and their ability, and that was my, that was my classroom. We didn't have any photography classes. And so when life came back as a monthly in 1978, I, that was my dream to go there and, and, and actually work at Life magazine. And I was lucky enough, John Loingar, the picture editor, hired me and not only sent me to photograph Bill and Willie, but I, three years earlier, I, I did this story on the Texas prison system. And this is just a simple picture of an inmate on a water truck with the, the guards behind him. Um, and hoeing in, in, in the mud and um, coming up out of the straw fields after a long day of work. Um, and this is a, an inmate named David Ruiz who um, would inflict scratches with a razor on his arm so he could be sent to the infirmary. And he was one of the first inmates that was calling attention to the brutality in the prison system back in their 82s and, and came to the attention of, of Judge Justice, who then made the landmark decisions. And there were tent cities because of the overcrowding at the prison. There were huge tent cities of inmates living out there. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, it's one of the, it's, you know, and, and so being with life, we were allowed to go in there and, and, and photograph that. And I've just been going through the old material. There were 200 rolls of film that, and it boils down to an eight page story where six or seven pictures. Right, right. And yeah, and so, and, and Judge, the portrait of Judge Justice that I showed earlier was made, um, was made for the story. and. So he lived in, you know, lived in Tyler, Texas, a very conservative part of the state where he is making, um, in that part of, the, of Texas, very unpopular but courageous decisions. And um, so I said, you know, how do I photograph this man? Because I tried photographing him in the audience in his office and I didn't think I had anything that really was provocative and storytelling and would fit for purpose with the end of the story. So it was dusk, and I said, would you grab your road, rope and let's go out to a road, and I'd like to make your portrait. And I set up a little light and did the picture. And he was grabbing his robe, and he said, you know, I would never go to a country road and put on a robe and stand there. <laughs> <laughs> as we often do as photographers, I, I smiled very, and I said, please, <laughs> trust me. And, um, and so we made the picture and it ran two pages in the magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was telling David, I met Judge Justice and saw him years later and said, I'm the one that took that picture of you in Life Magazine. And he said, I never liked that picture. <laughs> We got off to a good start. <laughs> but um, so I was thinking after, and David said, I'm going to ask you about that because it's an interesting situation as a journalist, photojournalist. What happens when you're twisting an arm to the way you see something right. and it collides with the way the person sees himself? So we'll go back to the fact he's a courageous man. He did some, he did some very, very brave and great things for Texas. But he was also a humble and modest man. Mm -hmm. And I think being statuesque and being the symbol in the middle of the road, he was so modest that he was uncomfortable with it. Yeah. And you're at knee height or something, or the camera's at, yeah. you know, looks like you're I was down knee low. Height. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's also funny how he doesn't think this is, you know, like an accurate image of him. He doesn't think of no, no. I mean, this yeah. is something that he would ever do. Well, so, to God. yeah, yeah, and yeah, that too, yeah. But he changed the 
the world for Texas. Yeah, so it, I mean, it's an interesting topic. You could, God, you could debate it all day long. And, and uh, I, I, um, I did try to convince him otherwise that it was a little bit better picture. <laughs> okay, so John, um, John Madden. And while I was working at the Miami News in 1975, there, um, um, the, both the Herald and the Miami News building, which we had probably 30 photographers between us, to get on any, to start any assignments, you had to get on the expressway, and this man sat beneath the expressway. And I'd see him, and he kind of haunted me. I'd see him day in, day out, day in, day out. He didn't panhandle people with bringing things and offering money. And he was an alcoholic. He's John Madden, 57 years old. And I said, I just, I got to know who this man is. And I was scared to death. But I parked my car around the corner. I didn't take my cameras. And I went around, and I met Madden, who was from Warren Springs, Georgia. And um, he's a guy that lived underneath the expressway. He drank too much homeless, and I started photographing him and uh, chronicling his life. And, and the paper ran it, and I, it, it, every, you know, I, I felt like a camera was, in some ways, was just a tool like a toothbrush. It got the job done. I communicated with the readers of the paper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, I, but homelessness was always something that, that I don't know, for whatever reason, caught it in my gut, and I was compelled to tell that story with the camera. And it was for this story you won another yeah. Robert F. Kennedy. Those, I only won two, so don't make it sound like I did anything too good. <laughs> I wasn't going to. You just, OK. <laughs> uh, but of course, that you talk about John Madden uh, yeah. at length at the beginning of Hard Ground. And if you don't know Hard Ground, the, the book, it's, it's powerful as powerful can be, and, and really just wonderfully printed, beautifully done, and an amazing kind of story. Yeah, so thank you. you. And, and uh, this uh, DJ Stout designed the book. Um, um, it's been great to work with him, giving, gave the pictures a voice. Uh, and this is Stephen Robert Blair, and I started on a, just doing a project without any intention except help, helping out the the homeless charity Mobiles and Fishes, which serves the homeless by feeding them meals downtown. And the editorial world has shifted. The assignments were falling through. There wasn't enough work. And so I almost sought solace by going down every Tuesday night and spending time with the homeless and having a large format camera and photographing them. And I would let them, I would talk to them and just take notes of what they say, <coughs> what they told me. And so it became a picture book with poems by Tom Waits and then notes in the back of, of, of uh, the various subjects in the book. Mm -hmm. And, and um, um, it was, um, it was kind of like for me why I was sort of floundering around what to do with my life at this point. It, was, it anchored me and gave me a, a sense, sense of purpose by, while um, um, <coughs> Being, being with these people, I, felt, I always felt uh, a commonality or kinship mm -hmm. with. Yeah. I, I've always loved your you know, celebrity or photographs of renowned people, but I think really where, to me, your talent shines the best is when you're photographing everyday people, common people, homeless people. Um, so let's jump all the way back to Miami again. Uh, Once again, it's the... The Cordero family. Yeah, the Cordero family, and, and it was a story about uh, their car, stolen cars, and it was just a late night's assignment to go down to Homestead, Florida, and, 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 um, and a lot of photographers would complain that, it's, oh, this isn't a good story, this isn't, this isn't really, I'm, I'm more capable, I should get, be getting better assignments. I was like, every assignment has so much potential, what you could take and make of it, if you just be sensitive to people, and so, they had a living room, and so I started, I think, developing a style for environmental portrait and mm -hmm. portraiture. And I, you know, I, in the world, you get a lot of several celebrity assignments because magazines run them, and I'm fortunate to have it. But I, the interesting people are the everyday and and the common man. Yeah. <laughs> And, back uh, to Tennessee. Back in Tennessee, uh, <laughs> not far from the tobacco barn. And 
what can I say? You, it, I was, they were walking through town, and, and I got them to stop. And, um, and the, the, for two, I was looking for a background, like simple. And then I found the Swift ice cream sign. And yeah. it have, the colors echoed what's in the dresses. So it's, oh, it's eerie. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's really fantastic. And Annie Mae, oh, OK. Well, no, I mean, you've talked about her. Uh, I wanted in this conversation with Michael, you know, we'll look at some images that are, you know, not so happy, not so uh, uplifting, I guess you could say. So we, we definitely wanted to end on some, some positive notes. And, okay. and again, so did you go back and show this to her? Has she seen this photograph? No, no, she didn't see it. And, and um, I was finishing up an assignment uh, in, in Waxahachie. And this, and it was um, near Christmas. And you can't help but see this old cap stand sign hanging down with the, with the incandescent bulb lighting it. And it, it, you feel like you're on a movie set. But this is like the real world in Waxahachie. So I was just curious, like, what, what is it? And who works there? Yeah. And then I was touched because the, the Christmas lights, the holiday lights were up. And so I went and knocked on the door, and I met Annie Mae Hayes, and she was a lovely lady. And it was too late that day to do the picture. And I said, I would really like to make your picture, and I'm going to stay in town an extra day if you do it tomorrow night about this time around dusk. And she said, I'd love to. And so she sat out there, and we, we made the picture. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific. So um, the, the last thing we talked about, I, I wanted to what everybody loves, of course, is you know, behind the scenes anecdotes of taking a photograph of a famous person or what have you, uh, and all that. So, the one story that I wanted you to tell is the one about Sissy. Oh, I didn't know you were going to have this in. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't want to, should we have him talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> it's an it's an embarrassing story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, I was living in New York. I had met DJ Stout, and I loved Texas Monthly Magazine. I had done one assignment from DJ before. And he said, Mike, I want you to come down. He said, well, first of all, I, I'm going to spend a lot of I want you to come down from Brooklyn with your assistant and photograph Sissy Spacek. Oh my god. I love Sissy Spacek. <laughs> she won an Academy Award for playing Loretta Lynn in Coal Miner's Daughter. She's one of the best actresses that ever lived. You mean come down with my assistant and my equipment and get to go to Quitman, Texas and photograph Sissy Spacek. Oh my God, DJ, I love you. <laughs> so he said, I'm spending half my budget to get you down here. So DJ got a stylist. He loaded up his car, piled it, loaded up the car with clothes for Sissy Spacek's wardrobe. He drove up from Austin to Quitman, and he arranged, they arranged for a limousine to take Sissy Spacek, who was, she was flying back to Virginia where she lived, but she would agreed for Texas Monthly to stop in her hometown. And uh, she had her hair and makeup guy with her, and Texas Monthly had to spring to get her a limousine to drive her from Dallas to all the way to equipment. Boy, this was like, this is the fat pitch. I want to knock it out of the park, do the best thing I can. So we start off uh, making a photograph of Sissy and her dad. And we had this beautiful old house in town. And it's a, God, she's sitting there on a sofa in a love seat with her dad. They look so comfortable together. It is a beautiful picture. And we did, that's our morning shot. And then we were going to take a break and go out and do pictures with horses in the field for the afternoon in, in locations like this. And Sissy is, she's, a, she's, she's cooperating, but she's, you know, she's looking at the Polaroids and, you know, this is my hair is too flat and this and that and everything. And, but we, you know, we, DJ and I look at the picture, this is really good. And so we kind of wrap it up and pack up. And um, DJ, the stylist, and myself, we go down to this little small town diner in Quitman. And we're having lunch. And Sissy wants to spend some time with her dad and, and then get ready for the afternoon. 
and we're halfway through our meal, and Sissy walks in. And she looks over at DJ. She walks in this thing, and everybody turns her head. Sissy Spacek just walked in this restaurant. And she goes up to DJ, and she says, DJ, she said, I, I just don't feel comfortable with that picture. And DJ says, but Sissy, it's a lovely shot of you and your dad. And Sissy says, but, and then nothing came out except her face to string with tears. And she said, she started bawling and she stormed out. Oh my God. <laughs> there goes all of D Texas Monthly's money. <laughs> I'll never be hired again. <laughs> this is the end. This is where it all stops, 1990. <laughs> and we, so we, we jump back in our cars and we haul butt to the uh, little motel that we're all staying at. And we go up to her hair and makeup guy, Kelvin. And said, what, what, what is going on here? And Kelvin said, I don't know, but she says, we're getting the hell out of here. <laughs> and then S Sissy comes, Sissy is getting her, getting some clothes out of the room and then DJ stops and says, we, look, we gotta talk. You know, I've spent half my budget. I've driven all over Austin. What, you know, what's, what's going on here? And so they go back and they go back to a room and they talk and talk and talk and finally they, they come out and Sissy's agreed to do the afternoon shoot. And boy, at this point, as we start the afternoon shoot, we're groveling. We said, Sissy, is this okay if we move a little bit this way? And look at this Polaroid we took. It really can look good. And we, we coax and we, and, we, and we get through the afternoon and we, we um, we ended up making some lovely pictures like that. And she's smiling, so you can see she likes DJ and me at this point <laughs> in the day. Okay, so the story comes out. So we worked with her and agreed to show her some of the pictures and everything before they were published, which they don't like to do. And I'm back in Brooklyn. My son Jesse is, uh, you're four and a half years old, and it's about a few days before Christmas, and my office was in my home, and Jesse picks up the phone, and he couldn't enunciate clearly at that time in his life. I mean, it was just four and a half. He said, Dad, it's Diffy Pekek on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and Sissy, and I get on the phone, I said, Sissy, I said, oh, is something wrong? And she said, I just want to say I love the pictures. And she said, these are some of the best photographs we've ever made. And she said, I am so sorry the way I acted, but I was going through a rough time. The movie companies were kicking me around like a hockey puck, and you guys got the brunt of it. And she said, I love the photograph of me and my dad. Could I get a copy? Um, so thanks for answering the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and DJ, thanks for the assignment. <laughs> and, and You saved the day, DJ. And, Thank you all very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I know the program has gone a bit long, but we, we do want to open it up to a couple of questions from the audience. If Michael, if you yeah. still indulge us. that so many, so many of your photos are at dusk. Is this your favorite time of day to shoot? Or? Yeah, yeah, it is my, yeah. I, I like other times too, but it's, uh, the light's beautiful to work with that time and it, it works with the way that I, I use an auxiliary light too, so yeah. You, you, you caught my secret. It's just Thank you, thank you. And, the, and like the picture of Annie Mae Hayes, it wouldn't work unless it was the light levels were all the same. Yeah, yeah. How did you get Kinky Friedman to wear a t toga? <laughs> seems like an odd choice. I, I think it was an idea hatched between, I mean, it's like a creative think tank down there in Kerrville and, and all the angels were flowing fairy dust and we, he said, what are you gonna wear? And he said, you didn't have anything to do, but he had a sheet. And <laughs> What's your lowest golf score? 
asked like a competitor. On Willie Nelson's course, it was I, I bogeyed the par 22. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, I was with Willie on the golf course, on, on the golf course up there about oh, I don't know, twenty something years ago. Anyway, and we got to we got to par through, we got to the third hole, and we ended up uh, drinking Lone Star there for about four hours. And I said, <laughs> "I'll leave, Willie." I said, "God, what about all these golf?" Players? I said, "He said, you know what? When you own your own golf course, you can do anything you want." I said, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> What is your favorite Willie Nelson story? <laughs> that you can tell. <laughs> that you can tell. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, there's so, I mean, so many good. I, I was lucky enough to hang out with Willie while um, Bill was making the movie with him. And, um, I got my favorite story is, you know, I, 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 the way he treated, my favorite is not a special story, but I just was impressed by, the, by the, his kindness and his gentleness and the way he, um, you know, treated everybody. And I remembered his, his first wife visiting the set, and it was only, everybody was off the bus, it was just Willie and his wife. And I was, by that time, was just the fly on the wall sitting there taking pictures, and they were, sitting there talking about when they had the kids and they're riding in an old Oldsmobile on the back seat and just sort of reliving those years before he was famous and how in sync he was. His life had gone, their lives had gone different directions, but they reconnected for that moment. And uh, seeing that uh, um, was, uh, was very touching, something I'll never forget. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. And um, you'd, you'd mentioned the Willie Nelson that's in the National Portrait Gallery, um, and you have a number of pieces there. Could you talk a little bit about what it's like to have work in, in, in that gallery, and then also maybe about what the process is um, for getting in there? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the way you, 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 mm. <laughs> well, you have to be lucky. Oh, okay. My wife's coaching me right, right at this juncture. I'm, 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 I'm talking to my counsel. Um, well, it, just, it seems like it's um, a huge deal. It's, it's very impressive. Yeah, well, um, look, you know, it, it goes, it, it's great. I, I feel so honored to have them in there and in some ways um, in that they become permanent and people can go back and see them over the years and that lucky that you know that people care enough that I was able to make a um, a notable picture of, of somebody that was important enough to to have in the portrait gallery and it's just like here at the Whitliff the wonderful thing is that they're in collection in the collection forever and ever and people can come and look at them and research them and 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 that knowledge is preserved what a year. Beyond that, the, the ringer that you have is that uh, Bill Whitliff has, has some influence up at the Portrait Gallery. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to avoid saying that, but just <laughs> and I took, what, 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 what do you want to say? I'll add something here. To, you stand up. To, to yeah. I'll add <laughs> What meant, the, what meant the most to Michael was taking our three children there and showing them that he had these pictures in the National Portrait Gallery. And that really, I mean, he became very emotional when he saw they witnessed this and saw them on the walls. And that was the most meaningful part of the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, Michael and Elizabeth will be signing books at the uh, um, front area where you receive, where you picked up your name tag, and books are for sale on your left. And uh, we do have, um, 
We had um, surveys on everybody's uh, chair, so if you have a minute to fill that out, that would be great. There are pencils on different tables around the gallery. Thank you so much for coming.